a lot of people still think that uh, you know matter is is something which is solid, but but I mean it 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 seems that that's not the case. I mean we ninety nine point nine 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 percent of everything is empty space for one thing, and even the right. subatomic particles themselves they're not really solid. They're they like bundles of energy. Is that right? Is that that if that yes is not, mm. yeah. And so yeah, that's correct. And so, like, if we if we really really think about it, then everything is really just made out of energy. Um, is that a correct? Yeah, I think that especially thing? after the influence of relativity theory and the establishment of the equivalence between energy and mass, E mm -hmm. equals m c squared. So that means that uh, wherever you have matter which has mass, that mass is is a form of energy and it's convertible in principle into any other form of energy. So yes, it's all energy. The only aspect of what you said that I would offer uh, a little correction to was the idea that what's between the atoms and the, the various basic particles is empty space. In the context of quantum field theory, empty space acquires a good bit of structure of its own. So as one famous physicist, Steven Weinberg, recently said or once said, empty space is not so empty. Mm. It has a good bit of structure to it uh, at, at the quantum mechanical level and at the relativistic level. Um, and, and there's a lot going on there. And we don't understand it all completely well. Mm. And, and in the past, there was the concept of the ether. Like, does that bring, bring it back? into uh light again like because we're if we're saying empty space is not just empty space does that mean there is some kind of an ether or something there are people there are people who have argued that it's a controversial point because what ether meant when it was prominent in late 19th century physics and very early 20th century physics is that it meant that there was a preferred frame of reference with respect to which the ether was at rest and the laws of nature were supposed to look maximally simple when expressed in terms of that frame of reference. Now, when we say today that, uh, that space has struck empty space, otherwise empty space has structure, and it's not so empty, people are not reinvoking that idea of a preferred frame of reference because all of our current best theories are quite compatible with the principle of relativity, mm -hmm. namely that there is no such thing as absolute motion, all motion is relative motion, and all reference frames are equivalent at a certain level, especially in the context of general relativity, all reference frames, all coordinate systems, no matter how curvilinear they may be, they're all equally suitable for expressing the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look in the right places, you can find some indications that maybe that's not such a good idea, but it would be very controversial to try and champion the idea that, that, that some people think of, some people think of the cosmic microwave background radiation as establishing a preferred frame of reference. Mm -hmm. But none of our theoretical laws, none of our theories that have been presently established indicate any preference to any frame of reference at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so if you, if you look at space itself, um, and you know, there's dark matter and all of the other things that we haven't even really discussed yet, but um, so, uh, you know, in re in, I guess in recent, in, in the new physics, the, the need for a, uh, a, a, of a container as such that, that holds everything. And that's what I kind of wonder about is, Everything else is changing. Do we not need to have a constant um, container that holds all the change that's taking place in the universe? 
um, that uh -huh. in, in that empty space. So if everything is changing, and it kind of it, in a way, it is compatible with. Uh, so you know we have matter and antimatter, and um, uh, uh, like you know the antiparticles, the concept that everything that there is, there's a there's the opposite of it as well. So if we have constant change, then the opposite of constant change is is a form of a constant and and uh, right. for that to not be present it, it kind of seems to contradict every other law of physics that we have that there is something that opposes um uh whatever that there is <laughs> if you know right yes yes um i think you could probably find people who would champion either side of that particular argument, especially among philosophers of science. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything clean that one can say of a purely scientific nature about that particular question. The best modeling source that we have at present for building a model of the universe as a whole mm -hmm. comes from general relativity. And in general relativity, the structure of space and time is determined by the distribution of energy and mass through space and time. And the way that energy and mass moves around in space and time is determined by the structure of space and time. So it's a closed circle and there's nothing in that context, there's nothing external mm -hmm. which holds that closed circle together. It just, it just, as somebody said, uh, space time tells energy matter how to move, and energy matter tells space time how to curve, give, giving rise to non Euclidean geometries and curvature of space time. Mm. And at present, there is nothing in our theoretical apparatus that provides an external framework within which all the stuff that I've just mentioned takes place. It just takes place in its own framework. It builds its own framework somehow. Yeah, and that's that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm finding very difficult to kind of conceive. Like even so, if we go back to the uh to the uh, moment of the big bang like that there was or there right. must have been something outside that singularity that was that allowed that to take place so what it, what was that was that space was that you know yeah. the, the so the constant that and it's very it, it, it'll be impossible to measure that because it permeates everything that there is so how could we detect it if it permeates everything uh, uh, and and so that I, the detection of a constant would be almost impossible, like for uh, I guess yeah. from a physics perspective. Yeah, we tend what we tend to discover and what we tend to measure are differences. Something changes from one situation to another situation, and we detect the change, mm -hmm. and we measure the change. But it might be worth mentioning that when when the Big Bang idea. Your, your phones anymore? Yeah, it's not. It's not. Just one moment. <laughs> could you? Okay. Gordon, can, can, could you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, perfect. Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I'll okay. this. Yeah. I'll put it away. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Should I try to do the same thing? <laughs> uh, whatever is comfortable for you. <laughs> I'll keep them in. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> this okay. one just stopped working, so I'm just taking it out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So what I was going to say was in the very early days of Big Bang cosmology, mm -hmm. people tended to think of the Big Bang as a kind of creation event, in which case time itself might have been created along with the universe. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't ask what was before the Big Bang, because then you would say, what do you mean by before, right? Yeah. But today, in the context of current research in quantum gravity, the Big Bang is no longer thought of, or at least among many researchers, it's no longer thought of as a creation event. Mm -hmm. It tends to be thought of as the coming out, the, 
the far side of a big bounce mm -hmm. where there was a preceding, well, the same universe, but a preceding stage of the universe when it was kind of shrinking mm -hmm. and collapsing, but it didn't go to a singularity, it bounced. And that's what we call, that bounce is what we call the Big Bang. So it's not a creation event. You can ask what was before the Big Bang. The quantum gravity people try to tell us what was before the Big Bang, but it re it revises it re uh, it brings back the concept that time is eternal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that there is no beginning. Now that's not a doctrinaire position. Most researchers in quantum gravity will tell you that you know they can't commit themselves one way or another to mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. but it's a possibility. It opens up that possibility. And the creation event interpretation of the Big Bang is no longer so widely accepted. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and and that I think that, I mean, and one, I guess in my mind, I never really uh, considered the Big Bang as a creation. I thought of it as a, I mean, one of the things that that makes sense to me, in, in fact, is the the continual uh, expansion and contraction of the universe, like the universe kind of. Uh, being created right, yeah, and yeah, yeah. contracting, and and then, so that kind of repeats all throughout time. And so for for us uh, at the moment, what I mean, the, they say the universe is obviously expanding, but at some point it will slow down. It may contract, and then uh, the whole process may take place yeah. again. You know, so it, yeah. Well, you know, there there are a lot of there are a lot of possible worms in that can. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the following sense. You know, for a while now, we have been told and essentially accepted that there's dark energy mm -hmm. and the dark energy is producing accelerated expansion so that the universe is expanding faster now than it was a few billion years ago. But right now, that claim, which I believe received the Nobel Prize when it was first uh, published mm -hmm. shortly after that, but that claim is now being challenged mm -hmm. and by co other cosmologists. And it's being challenged because the, the, the challengers claim that the original researchers assumed that the homogeneity and isotropy of the universe on the largest scales applied to the scales that they were using in their analysis of type 1a supernovas, which led them to the conclusion that the expansion was accelerating. And the challengers are saying that those homogeneous and isotropy assumptions do not apply to that scale. You still have inhomogeneity. And this, this badly affects your analysis of the data, and at present, the data, as far as anybody can tell, is compatible with no acceleration to the expansion at all. Mm. And that maybe there isn't any dark energy, and it's up in the air right now. And the, the two groups are arguing with one another. Oh, wow, right. No, I didn't yeah. know about that part. <laughs> no, that's great. That's interesting. So, uh, I, I, and I, uh, I, I mean, in my mind, I've been kind of trying to create my own theory and it's probably not right because I, I don't read as widely as uh, most people so I just try to imagine things a lot <laughs> right right uh, yes. uh, and and uh, so so one of the things that I, and I, I'll try to find it for you I try to kind of create a, uh, a diagram of what it might look like um, in terms of how the universe will expand or contract but it could simply be a a sinusoidal wave where uh, at some, any point in time uh, we could measure the acceleration of expansion uh, and mm -hmm. as and it may reach zero so then you know the acceleration will reach zero at the top of the crest and then it will right. actually start ac decelerating the opposite direction which would eventually cause the universe to to contract and then reverse so it will kind of what happens is protons become negative and you know so if if we go in in the opposite direction yeah, yeah, everything yeah. will be reversed and so we kind of uh continue like that uh throughout 
uh, time. So does does that is that kind of does that make sense, or is that a very outlandish kind of well, idea? Well, <laughs> let's put it this way: in the early days of cosmology, and by early days I mean from the time general relativity was first published, which would be 1915, 1916, mm -hmm. uh, until Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe in 1929, but then all the way up until the cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered in about 1957. Throughout that time, there was very little data concerning cosmology, mm -hmm. very little data, hard data. Mm -hmm. And so people were building models that were all over the map. They were using general relativity to try and see just how wildly variable the various possible universes could be. And then the question would be, okay, which one of these do we live in? Mm. And people modeled the kind of universe, at least some of the kinds of universes you're talking about. Ones that expanded, contracted, expanded, contracted, expanded, contracted, endlessly. Mm -hmm. Some of them always expanded the same amount, contracted to zero, expanded the same amount, contracted to zero. Others expanded largely, then a little bit smaller, then a little bit smaller, then a little bit smaller, then a little bit smaller. And almost any variation you can think of that would be compatible with what were believed to be the other laws of nature, besides general relativity, quantum mechanics, so on and so forth, Pretty much somebody explored, and that stuff is all in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, and so today is regarded as a kind of golden age of cosmology because we finally have access to a tremendous amount of data. Mm. And the main thing that has produced that is the existence of brand new technology for Earth-based telescopes and the telescopes that we put in orbit in space that get so much better imaging than ordinary telescopes on the Earth. Uh, and that's produced um, a, a flood of big data mm. uh, in cosmology that is now slowly but surely constraining the possible models of the universe that one can get away with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So has that, so this new recent data has that uh, kind of um, eliminated some of those models that were uh, developed in the in, in the nineteen twenties, and so kind of we have we there are fewer possibilities of what where which universe we are in at the moment. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I now you know I I don't know the details of that kind of thing, but I think it's safe to say that most of those early models are no longer taken seriously. Right. They are recognized as solutions of, of Einstein's equations because Einstein's equations in general relativity allow for an incredibly varied family of solutions. Mm -hmm. So most of them are ruled out at present. Um, but among the ones that aren't yet ruled out, there's still quite a bit of, of variability. And like I say, or said before, uh, almost everyone that practices cosmology today still does use the assumption, some strictly assumption, that at the largest scales, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Now, the thing is, at the largest scales, the largest scales, we don't have any data. We don't have any data at all. So the universe could be quite inhomogeneous and very tropic. <laughs> and we wouldn't know it because it's at the largest scales. But nobody would know what to do if that were the case. So in order to keep things workable, Everybody assumes that at the largest scale of the universe is homogeneous and isotropic because they'll say, what else can we do? And, and, and that's the context in which cosmology operates today. But, you know, uh, a very interesting historical example of a model that was thrown out mm -hmm. shortly after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background 
was the so-called steady state model. And the steady state model, it was, it was aware of Hubble expansion because that had come in 1929. And the steady state model, which was championed by several uh, British cosmologists, Hoyle was one of them, and I'm blocking on the names of the others. They believed that notwithstanding the expansion, the recession of galaxies that were already distant from one another, getting further and further apart, that new matter was always being created and being created at just such a rate everywhere throughout the universe, being created at just such a rate so that you would always have the same density of galaxies, notwithstanding the fact that the galaxies that already exist are receding from one another, new galaxies are always being formed. And this slow process guarantees that on the largest scales, the universe will always look the same. Uh, that, will, that scheme was ruled out by the discovery of the cosmic microwave background because people said, if you retrace the, where the cosmic microwave background had to come from, right now it's very cold radiation, very long wavelength radiation, but as you go back into the earlier universe, taking the expansion back, that radiation gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and eventually you get back to the Big Bang. And that, that didn't seem to be compatible. The, uh, the steady state people were never able to recoup from that. I mean, they didn't really accept that rejection, mm -hmm. but neither were they able to mount a serious defense of their position. Yeah. Got it. And, and the, the earlier uh, concept we, uh, we discussed, the expansion and the contraction, is that still up for debate as whether that that could be one of the well like i said in, in in certain at least in certain research groups into quantum gravity like especially the loop quantum gravity research effort mm -hmm. which actually which has a big uh a big center for here at penn state mm -hmm. um they have become convinced that the big bang what we call the big bang is is a kind of bounce Mm. Now, is it a bounce that's just of a kind, like from minus infinity in time, you get a universe that's contracted, it bounces once, and then it expands forever? That's a possibility. Or is it a bounce that goes again and again and again and again? I don't think the loop quantum gravity people are in a position to say one way or the other which of those schemes is the case. Mm -hmm. But I'm not an expert on loop quantum gravity. Mm. I don't think they're in a position to do that. Got it. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm still still quite fascinated by the by the concept of the constant. Like, you know, what? How do we? You know, how we obviously uh, it probably we can't measure it, but like, you know, are there any kind of theories out there which uh, point out that there, we need some kind of a constant for like a a, a fabric that everything else kind of takes place, you know, whether, it, so, so, you know, it, you know, if we, if fabric sounds like the ether in a way, but uh, I think it's more than just that, it's like kind of something which has to be there for everything else to take place, all the other phenomena. Right, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's safe to say that most of the people who do research in an attempt to go beyond relativity theory and go beyond quantum mechanics to build a, a theory for the most fundamental structure of the universe as a whole. And there are people who are that ambitious who are really trying to do that. And sometimes I'm very skeptical of that level of ambition. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah. most of the people who try to do that frequently argue on behalf of not making any assumptions about the background because they feel assumptions about the background, no matter what assumptions you make, will be too constraining 
to allow you to make the progress you want to make. Now, not everybody feels that way. In particular, the string theorists. The string theorists who believe that all the fundamental ingredients of, in, in existence are these little wiggly strings that are doing their wiggling in higher dimensions, 10 dimensions, 11 dimensions, whatever have you. They assume that the background, let us say, 11-dimensional space-time that they're working in is perfectly flat, not curved at all. And that what we sometimes, what we think we see or observe or get evidence for, the curvature of four-dimensional space-time, that's just something, that, that's a kind of phenomenon that occurs within the flat 11-dimensional space-time background. So that's their container, to use your term. I don't, I have my doubts that that would satisfy you as a container, but in any case, they work that way. But the people who work in loop quantum gravity, they're very much against the idea of assuming any kind of a background at all. Mm -hmm. They want to preserve the feature of general relativity in which there really is no background. You just you just look for space-time structures that are consistent with Einstein's equations, and anything you find is fair game for possible comparison with the structure of the universe that we observe. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, no, it's interesting. I just find it fascinating that there's so many different uh, schools of thoughts, you know, within physics, yes. it's almost like... There are, there are. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, you know, there's a, besides the books that I mentioned to you before, there are books written for the general public by some of the people who do this kind of research, uh, and I'm thinking in particular of a guy named Lee Smolin, who used to belong to the Penn State faculty, and then he went and formed the Perimeter Institute. He, found, he helped found the Perimeter Institute in, in Canada, which is a world-class theoretical physics research place. And he has written books uh, titled things like Three or Four Paths to Quantum Gravity and The Trouble with Physics and... Uh, Time Reborn and... Uh, let's see... Uh, Einstein's Unfinished Revolution. And you might find these books quite interesting, you know, because on one hand, they're not terribly technical, but they go pretty deep into the kind of thinking that is going on in those researchers, in, in the, the minds of those researchers. That'd be great. And whenever you want to send any, anything of yours, uh, feel free. That, that would be fine. I'm very grateful. I have lots of time to read things. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so I, I will. Uh, some of them are kind of more, mostly philosophical rather than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, scientific. So if that's okay with yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Well, when when I was still employed at Penn State, I spent some years team teaching interdisciplinary courses with members of the philosophy department. Oh, wonderful. And that was that was quite fun. Yeah. I enjoyed that very much. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really it. I mean, that's the thing. It's it. I guess physics and philosophy are go very well hand in hand. A lot of it, it's it's um, uh, a lot of things that can be described. Today, <laughs> there was a period. There was a period when the scientists became rather dismissive and disdainful of philosophy. Mm. But that day has passed, and yeah. we now recognize a certain need for philosophy in order to keep our heads straight. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Your sense making machines, we gotta kinda of try to come up with some right. some models, right? So but yeah, yeah thank you yeah. thank you so much, Gordon. So uh, I'm looking forward to yes. our next conversation in a couple of weeks, same time on Very Wednesday. Good. Thank you Very again. Good. Take care. Tom. And you have a good evening.